Thank you for joining us for the inaugural show of Perspectives, brought to you by the Mission and Installation Contractor Command. I am Ben Gonzalez, your host and the MIC Public Affairs Officer. Joining us today is General Jeff Gabbard, the MIC Commanding General. Thank you for taking the time today, General. A uh, pleasure to be here, Ben. Let's start with a little more insight on you. Could you tell us, uh, you know, everybody's read your biography and they've, they've seen you, at least heard you maybe once or twice. But they may not know is where you grew up and why you decided an Army career. Can you tell us a little bit about your history? Sure, Ben. My father uh, was a non-commissioned officer. He served 28 years in the United States Army, served in Vietnam, and that had a big influence on me as a young uh, child, of course, so I grew up as an Army brat. I went to 13 different schools, uh, and that uh, brought a different perspective uh, to my life uh, and inspired me to, of course, follow my father because he's always been my mentor. And did that have a big uh, impact on joining the Army? It sure did. So it was not a combination of my father uh, as that mentor and influence in my life. And plus, you know, we lived in Germany and my sisters went to the universities, uh, University of Maryland at Munich. And uh, they went on a trip to then uh, Prague, Czechoslovakia, and I was uh, able to go with them. And this is when the Berlin, this is when the wall was still up in Berlin, and uh, communism was a big threat to the United States. And I was able to go there, and part of that uh, experience, uh, see how the Soviet citizens lived and interact with with them, and that also had a big influence on my life and how much I cherish the freedom and the things that our nation stands for. Okay, now I know you've been doing contracting for, for quite a while, but what did you do when you first joined the Army? So when I first joined the Army, I uh, joined the Army in uh, 1986, and I, uh, my first duty station was Fort Bliss, Texas with the 3rd Armored Cavalry Regiment, and my first job was a petroleum platoon leader for the support squadron, 3rd ACR. Now, uh, I don't know if you feel like it, but December 2nd, to me, seems like a very long time ago when you took command of the MEC. What are your impressions of the MEC so far after almost uh, 100 days? Wow, so it seems like uh, yesterday, Ben. Uh, 100 days already, wow. So my impressions of the MEC are we are so blessed to have such a dedicated uh, workforce, both uh, military and civilian. Uh, it is a command that doesn't get, always get, uh, the accolades the, that they deserve. You know, every day uh, you look on Green Force Tracker and you see the civilians and military uh, serving beyond uh, normal duty hours trying to get that contract requirement done. So I'm just so impressed with the professionalism and dedication of our workforce. Now during your first town hall with the entire MIC workforce, you stressed the importance of accountability and respect for others. And then you sent out a message on February 6th uh, stating your command philosophy, and one of the things you talked about or stressed was think, act, lead, reflect, and transform. Can you share some more insight into your command philosophy? Sure, Ben. So again, at the, at the core of my philosophy is every individual has to have individual accountability for not only their own behaviors, but their own professional responsibilities that have been imparted upon them by the nature of their job. So it gets to uh, that personal accountability in everything we do is the nexus between the individual and our organization's success. Okay, and your mission and vision, it's brand new. Uh, do you wanna expand on, on what you see as what the MIC needs to focus on in the, ne in the near future? Sure, Ben, so that's very important. Uh, I put uh, many, uh, I would say, you know, hun about 100 hours uh, into studying, analyzing uh, every single word that's on that mission, vision, and commander's intent chart. Because every word on that chart means something. And I don't want that just to be a chart. I want it to be a tool that we can use, that every MIC member can look to 
as a guiding principle for what we stand for. New to our mission, so just in the mission statement, is that second, the last sentence in our mission statement, which is new to our formation, which is that we have to be, uh, we have to prepare our brigade size elements uh, to be trained and ready to deploy the operating force when called. And so I hope when I went around to each of the MIG offices, that really seemed to resonate uh, because some of our MIG members uh, thought that the, there was an intrusion of the military and that we were coming in and we were trying to, we were going to take over their jobs, for example, when really that is not the case at all. We are really asking for our, the support of our civilian members to train us, to teach us, so that when we are called, we can go forward in the battle space to support those war fighters. We can deploy so that they don't have to. And the second to, in, in applied task there is that when we do deploy, right, the office back at the home station can't collapse. So it has to operate as well. So we have those, it's a kind of a dual mission. One, train and be ready to go. And then when we do go, that civilian deputy has to step up into that leadership position and the organization cannot miss a beat because they have to continue to support that generating force, that insulation that's left behind. Okay. Can you go over some of your uh, priorities for the command, sir? Sure, so the priorities that I've established uh, really uh, reinforce that mission, vision, commander's intent chart. So these, after I did my mission analysis of the organization, these are the areas that I think that the organization needs to uh, work upon to bring it to the next level. So for example, uh, for various reasons throughout the last 10 years, we have brought a lot of execution tasks up to the headquarters level. So you're gonna see in the next 90 days where I am gonna power that uh, execution task back down to the office level. So what does that mean? So that means that uh, I have put in and requested to make each brigade a park. So it have also that will also include the FDO. The FDO will also be a park. So we're powering down all those authorities that used to be at the headquarters level. We are going to give them their own GPC program. We're not going to run the GPC program for, from the headquarters. That's another element uh, of, the, of my priority. But with that comes this individual accountability. So while we're going to accept risk as an army by powering those, letting go of the controls, powering that, those authorities down, there's going to be some more call for individual accountability. So for example, metrics. You, you're, the metrics are now are not just going to be a headquarters responsibility. It's going to be an office responsibility. It's going to be an individual responsibility. So it's not just about awarding contracts anymore. It's about a holistic situation, whether it comes to contract closeout, from CPARs, all the way across the gamut. UACs are all going to be measured, and we're going to be rated. And it, every person in our formation has to do their part in order for us to succeed. Okay, I, I think the command will really appreciate that. Uh, I know a lot of people in the field were wondering, you know, what's, what's in it for me or, or is, you know, the headquarters does seem like they make a lot of decisions, but I'm sure a lot of people will be happy about that. Speaking of the field, we had a number of questions from the field and I wanted to get into at least one of the questions initially. Uh, a lot of people were asking about the Army Contract Command Transformation Studies. Can you give us some insight as to what you see the future of ACC and the MIC? Sure, so to, to a certain extent, because some of these things uh, are not releasable yet, so we're still in the, in the planning stage, and I know that's not what our MIC members want to, want to hear, right? But what I ask for is some patience, because uh, a lot of times uh, when I was down at a lower level and I was looking up at my headquarters, and I always thought, you know, those guys, you know, they, they don't know what they're doing or they're, they're not being transparent. But yet, you know, their, char their chart and their words say they want you to be transparent. But what you have to take into uh, account here is that we, we want to be 
transparent. But at the same time, you have to give us a chance at the, at the headquarters level because this thing has to be vetted because we are just a team of teams, right? And you are a member of a team larger than the team you actually reside on right now. So what do I mean by that? So I'm the CG for the MIC, but I'm also a part of the ACC team. And I'm also part of the Army Materiel Command team. Mm -hmm. And I'm also a part of the Army team, right? right? And I'm also on a team for our nation. And that's what counts. And so I have to be accountable for all those layers. I have to take what the equities are for all of those teams, because we're a team of teams. So my point is, is that uh, I have to take everyone's uh, thing into account, and I have to brief the plan, and the plan has to uh, go through several layers of approval before we could implement it. So we have to be given some space so we can plan, because just because we have a plan doesn't mean it's going to be approved as it goes all the way up uh, through that approval process. So what I can divulge to our MIC members is that uh, we're not going to have a RIF, okay? And uh, while we might not be able to hire uh, to fill vacancies, no one right now in any plan that I have seen uh, calls for anybody uh, losing their job. And so with that, that's about all I can disclose at this time, but you can be assured that the moment that I'm at a el eligible or uh, given the authority to release what the, what the higher headquarters is thinking, you will be the first to know. Great, I know they're really looking forward to, to that information. Uh, another big impact is uh, the decision by Ms. Heidi Hsu, uh, the senior procurement executive and uh, Assistant Secretary of the Army for Acquisition Logistics and Technology. She recently designated General Vi, the Army Material Command, uh, Commanding General, as the head of contracting activity. What kind of ramifications is that gonna affect on the MIC? Right, so I was uh, Ms. Hsu's Chief of Staff when this whole initiative uh, started. And so I'm very familiar with Ms. Hsu's intent and what her overarching intent is, is to bring uh, standards across the Army contracting enterprise. So it's not just about AMC con uh, consolidating uh, down to one proponent for Army contracting and setting the standards, which is now General Vi, but it's also more holistic than that. So here there in the near future, PEO Stry, who has their own contracting entity, will now come apart of AMC, ACC, Contracting Command. And then once we achieve that, we will start to look at other areas of Army contracting, such as INSCOM, uh, and maybe even the, Cor the National Guard and the Corps of Engineers contracting entity will all come under one single HCA. Those are iterative phase decision points that will are being considered. But what, to your point, what it means for us in the MIC becoming under one AMC uh, entity is that as it gives me the opportunity now to, again, designate our brigades as parks and our FBO as a park and roll that authority down. So I am no longer an ACA. So in the spirit of Ms. Shu and our Army, I, I am now, my actions are now consistent with that by powering down these authorities to the lowest level possible. And so with that, uh, I believe that we'll see positive results from this initiative. More power to the field. There you go. Okay. That's it. You did mention a little bit about uh, hiring there and there was a number of questions from the field was concerning vacancies throughout the command is there a planned solution for retention and promotions of current MIC employees since many vacant position, positions are not uh, being filled? So there is. So this is a very complex uh, problem set that uh, our Army is struggling with. As you've all heard uh, in the news, right, that uh, our Army uh, continually has continued to get direction from uh, Congress, Senate, and the President on our budget which is driving a reduction in our formation. So the Army is gonna go from 45 
uh, brigade combat teams down to 32. Okay, and then we've just received uh, word here on the la uh, two days ago that we're going to reduce uh, down to 28 brigade combat teams. And this is all driven on a reduced budget and a reduced strategic outlook for where what our nation wants our army to do. So to answer your, uh, and be more direct to our MIC members, right, with that continued pressure to draw down both by numbers and uh, our budget, again, we belong a part of a team of teams. So we get our direction from the four-star headquarters in which we work, and that's Army Materiel Command. So a lot of uh, individuals in our command believe hey, it's the MIT commander. He has a budget, and he has authorities to hire people. Well, actually, uh, under these conditions, where we're trying to drastically um, draw down our force to match the budget to which we've been allocated, I don't really have the authorities some people think that I do have. So that's held at the ACC level and then the AMC level. Because AMC also, during the 10, ten years of war, uh, had a lot of overhires. And they're largely a reimbursable organization. And so that reimbursable money is, of course, drying up because the requirements uh, to fight two wars is gone. So what we've been given to date is the authority uh, to hire uh, one person for every two vacancies. But the catch is, those vacancies had to have occur occurred since the 2nd of January this year. Mm -hmm. So the MIC has over 215 vacancies, but we've only had 36 vacancies that have occurred since the 2nd of January. So as the MIC and the Army uh, gets their hands around you know, the budget and where we're going to head in the future, those uh, constraints will loosen up a little bit and we'll be able to hire more. But we're also going to have to transform the way that our formations currently work. And uh, so one of the ideas that's on the table is to go from a, to a small, medium, and large office construct. And who knows how that will play out and if it will be approved. But we will have to organize somewhat different uh, to match our reduction uh, in force. But again, that's not a riff. It's just that we're not going to be able to hire behind some of those vacancies. We're just going to have to do things, uh, do contracting differently than we have done before to meet our new authorizations. Sir, a challenge many of our contracting professionals in the field have to contend with is reverse auctioning. MIG success in saving money for our customers is tied directly to the FedBid tool of reverse auctioning. How can MIG acquisition professionals best utilize reverse auctioning? So, Ben, that's a great question. So, you know, I was just recently down at Fort Bliss, and I talked with one of our outstanding MIG members, uh, Melissa Garcia, and we talked extensively about this uh, reverse auctioning issue, and rather, uh, should we uh, mandate the use of uh, uh, reverse auctioning? Uh, or should it be optional? So as you know, the desk book uh, calls that each contracting officer sh you know, must use uh, the reverse auctioning uh, capability for certain NAICS codes uh, unless they get authorization from their director. So first of all, it can be waived, right, if you go to your office chief and have a valid reason why uh, it's not appropriate to use that tool. So that's the first point. Uh, so the second point is that we have received numerous emails, right, about our workforce not thinking that the reverse auctioning tool uh, should be mandated. So I took uh, that into account. So as I've said in previous uh, questions and uh, answer and town halls, is that we do take every mixed member's voice very seriously. So let me tell you what I'm doing. So what I did is I challenged my staff to do a study. We're going to do a controlled study where we're going to take a buy, several buys, 11 buys that uh, consist of those NAICS codes, and, and one we're going to do reverse auctioning, and then one we're not going to do reverse auctioning. And then we're going to see, is there truly a value or is it not? Inherently, we believe that from our business experience that 
we do get a cheaper price from using this tool. But again, as I said, when we hear something from the MIC workforce and we hear it not only from one member, that's very important, but we hear it from many members, it gets our attention. And we're not going to discount it because every voice is important. And we should challenge our assumptions uh, every single day because, again, I work and our staff works for those members in the field. So I'm looking forward uh, to you uh, helping me write that story, regardless of what it is, and we'll adjust the policy accordingly. So the second point to that is GSA is coming out with a reverse auctioning tool, and we're also taking a look at the GSA option, and we're going to, once we do a holistic look at this, we will revisit the reverse auctioning policy. Okay. I really do appreciate your time, uh, sir. Is there anything you wanted to add or stress? So again, going back to the beginning, uh, I would like to go back to my mission, vision, commander's intent. It talks about, number one, our first priority, of course, is shark. And that one incident is one too many. And it will not be tolerated in any of our formations. The second is about accountability. Each member of our team being accountable for themselves and for their work that they're assigned. And then third, that I am so humbled to be serving as your commanding general. I come to work every day and my commitment to you as when I took command was mission first and people always. And that means people mean both our military, civilian, and family members that make up the mission and installation contracting command. Great. Well, thank you for your time, sir. And thank you for watching the first half of our First Perspective show. We look forward to your comments and questions. You can email those questions to the email you have on your screen, or you can always use the Commander's Anonymous email located on the SharePoint. On behalf of General Gabbert, thank you for joining us today, and have a great day. Thank you.